Hey, nurses on fire. I'm super honored to have Aquania Escarne back with us. She was on episode 20 talking about how you too can be a U.S. diplomat. Hey, Aquania. Hey, Nasima. Thanks for having me back on the show. <laughs> Thank you again for coming back on and, um, because of what's going on right now in the U.S. in relation to COVID-19 and just kind of the hysteria and the shifts in everybody's lives that has happened, we wanted to discuss a super important issue today that can benefit, uh, that can affect you and your family. So um, Aquania, let's talk a little bit about actually let's talk about your background just a little bit for people that didn't listen to episode 20 but if you guys want to find out more about how to be a u.s diplomat go back and listen to episode 20 and you can find that at nurses on fire podcast.com slash 20 but uh give us a little bit of background about you what you do and then we'll talk dive into the very important subject that we're going to talk about today Okay, so I am a U.S. diplomat, and I've been working for the State Department for over 12 years now, where in foreign policy, I'm promoting U.S. relationships with other countries, helping American citizens abroad, and facilitating a lot of our logistics. So specifically right now, because of COVID-19, we've been facilitating the return of American citizens back to the United States for those that are overseas and wanted to come home and assisting our embassies and consulate staff with any support they need if they're choosing to stay and continue to serve overseas. Outside of that, I'm very passionate about financial literacy. I have my own platform, thepurposeofmoney.com. I have a podcast also called The Purpose of Money. And on my platform, I'm helping promote financial freedom and more ways to pay off debt, handle your finances, and get your lives in order so you can have a free, financially free life, and specifically focusing on women of color. So in that capacity, I also promote life insurance. So that's why we're going to talk about that today, because it's very important that everyone, everyone have life insurance. And I'll explain more why on the podcast today. But I've been selling life insurance for three years now and trying to really help people get themselves protected and help provide their family income if they are to pass, but also ability to build generational wealth. That's awesome. Before we dive into life insurance, you brought up something super important that I didn't want to pass over. But what is the situation internationally with diplomats that are out there in foreign countries um, like our countries like wanting them to leave because they're American or um, are we like trying to just get everybody back for safety? What is that looking like? In general, we're still promoting good relationships with any of our allies where we're located and no one has been forced to leave, but we are allowing American citizens who would like to come home to come home and we've been supporting American citizens in different ways, including helping them find commercial flights that they can get on or assisting with chartered flights that helps people return back to the United States because they may want to seek better health care here versus where they are, or maybe they just want to be reunited with family. So I'm proud to say that we've still been doing our day-to-day -day responsibilities as much as we can, but we have um, also facilitated support to Americans who are either living or visiting abroad and want to come home. So that's not exclusive to diplomats. That's anybody who's living, um, Americans that are living abroad, expats. It doesn't matter how long people have been out the country. As long as they're still a U.S. citizen, you guys are assisting them in getting back home. Yes. And we do help others, but our priority is American citizens. But in some cases, we have um, facilitated the return of legal permanent residents as well. Wow. Also okay. known as green card holders. Got you. Got you. Oh, that's super important to know. I guess you just kind of get out of touch <laughs> with what all the, um, the U S what is it called? The state department, um, does, um, internationally. And so you know, to put things in a broader perspective, like everybody in every country and every nation, I don't know one person that hasn't been impacted by this, but we're 
in isolation. So it's sometimes hard to visualize what's happening out there, especially on a global level. So thank you so much for sharing that because that's, that's really good information and it's comforting to know that you guys are actively doing that. So um, let's dive in and talk about the importance of life insurance in general. And then we're going to talk about it um, as far as what's going on right now, as it relates to this virus and just, yeah, as it relates to this virus and how things are changing. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm a big advocate for getting covered. Uh, Life insurance is a great way to protect your family. And the primary purpose is to ensure that if something happened to you, those that depend on you financially are still able to provide for themselves or have the resources, the financial resources they need in order to continue living the life that you want for them. So for a lot of people, that means if you have a family and you want them to live in the house where you're living, you want your children to go to college, you want them to be able to still have the lifestyle that they have currently, you buy life insurance, you pay for it while you're alive, and then the life insurance company pays a death benefit to your family, God forbid something happens to you. But life insurance is not just for people who have children and spouses, it's also for people who have any kind of dependent. So I wanna remind you that if a family member depends on you, which can include your elderly parents, siblings, cousins, godchildren, nieces, nephews, anyone who regularly comes to you for financial support is probably someone who depends on you for income. And that is why most people could argue that they need life insurance. And if you don't need it at this time in your life, you'll potentially need it in the future. So I always try to talk to people about it no matter their age because it's something that should be in the back of your mind. And when your lifestyle presents itself where you can afford to pay for it and you have those who are depending on your income so you have a reason to be covered, that's a great time to get life insurance. Yes, the very thorough explanation. Love Thank it. you. Okay. <laughs> So when it comes to life insurance, you know, um, there are several different kinds of life insurance and um, obviously it's going to depend on an individual level, what kind of life insurance you um, may need. But in general, what's the basic life insurance coverage most people out there need? So I'll go ahead and first explain what the two main types are. So just in case someone out there doesn't know, there is term life insurance and there's permanent life insurance. Term life insurance, the greatest analogy is a lease, a rent. You're renting for a term of time. Um, a term policy can be one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 or 30 years. What that means is I want insurance for a certain amount of time. That's the term you choose. And you will pay for that insurance for that duration of time. That's the length of your lease per se. However, when the time limit is up, so is the insurance. And unfortunately, if you haven't passed away, your family does not receive a death benefit and you do not get a refund for all the premiums you paid through the duration of the time that you had the policy. So in some cases, people will get life insurance in their 30s, for example. They will go and get a 30-year term policy. And in their 60s, they're facing retirement and they can choose to get a new policy, keep the one they have, but pay a much higher price for it, or decide they don't need life insurance anymore because they've built enough personal assets and they're self-insured, as we call it. And therefore, they don't pursue life insurance in retirement. However, permanent life insurance, on the other hand, is more like buying a mortgage or buying a house. You pay for it for the rest of your life or the terms that you've agreed to, but you do pay for it. It covers you until you die. And then once you die, your family is paid out. And that could be 20, 30, 40 years later, depending on the date in which you got the policy. Both of them normally involve a fixed premium amount, which means the price doesn't change. However, term life insurance, because it's normally for a shorter amount of time, it's much cheaper and it, in comparison to the reward. So you may pay a couple of dollars a month and be qualified for half a million or a million or more versus whole life insurance. If you wanted that same amount of coverage, you would pay a significant 
higher amount of money to get that same type of insurance, but it would be guaranteed to your family as long as you pay the premium every month until the month you die, right? So as far as what most people get, it really depends. I am a financial coach, a life insurance agent, and I also help with retirement planning. So we look at an individual situation and it's not always just about what you can afford, it's also about what your needs are. So as a mother of a special needs son, I'm gonna feel necessary to always have life insurance, even after retirement. So I have invested in whole life for my son's sake, but there are others who they have perfectly healthy children, once they reach retirement age, the children are grown, they have their own jobs, their own life insurance and their own finances. They may decide, I only need a term policy for 30 years and then I'm be self-insured and my kids really don't need this insurance money to bury me or to really facilitate me leaving them money. However, I work with clients to figure out what's best for them. A lot of times term is the more affordable solution. And then if you are seeking to use insurance in more creative ways, or you have a family situation where you need whole life insurance, then I work with you to find the whole life insurance that covers your needs, but it might cost more. Yeah. Can you explain self-insurance? So self-insured is just a term that basically means I am rich enough <laughs> that <laughs> I have money in the bank or I have easily accessible income, whether it be through assets that I can cash in or bank accounts that are fairly liquid, that I don't feel like I need a life insurance policy to cover my final burial expenses. Now, some people will look at this differently. Some people will think they're self-insured with 25 times their income. They're financially free. So why do they need to continue to pay for life insurance? Others may use life insurance as that guaranteed income to leave their family and allow that their assets that they build to be theirs and to do what they want, whether it's to give it away to charity when they die or to give it to their family. So I've seen people who use life insurance as that this is exactly what I'm going to leave my family. So I know you have more than when I came here, but everything else is mine or mine to do with. And not necessary for the planning of my final burial expenses or for your future education or other goals that I have for you. Awesome. Awesome. And a lot of times people use life insurance as a legacy building tool. So if they feel like they have enough to pass down in whatever accounts that they have, um, that's a form of self-insurance too. It's not just <clears throat> excuse me, it, 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 it sometimes goes beyond, you know, end of life expenses. So thank you so much for sharing that. So um, you want to talk about now, like what the difference is, is in life insurance or the importance of life insurance right now? Yeah, absolutely. So everyone knows that your future is not guaranteed and you never know when you're going to die, but we all know we're going to die. So <laughs> my advice is to get insured when you're young and healthy, as soon as you can, when you can afford it, and when you have dependents or someone else who relies on you. And I also want you to kind of think about some other factors. So before I get into the other aspects of your question, I want to talk about the DIME method. Uh, DIME stands for debt, income, mortgage, and education. This is a short and quick and easy way to determine how much life insurance you may need. Your debt refers to student loans, which a lot of us have car loan debt, credit card debt, any type of debt that you've accumulated that is not going to disappear when you die. Income is how much you're making, but when you are calculating your insurance need, you should take your income and multiply by 10. You can do as little as five, but I choose 10 because I like my clients' families to have some time to grieve and not have to worry about going right back to work. So giving them 10 years of your income gives them 10 years or more to really figure out what am I going to do? How am I going to make it without this person that meant so much to me? Mortgage is how much you have left on your home to pay. It doesn't necessarily mean when you get the insurance check, you're going to send a check to the mortgage company because some people would like to hold on to that cash and still pay the mortgage on a regular basis, but maybe not write a blank check right away. But then I have other clients who are like, no, I don't want to pay a mortgage anymore. So if something happens, I want my family to be able to write off the mortgage on the second day to get the check. So you always include the balance at the time of your application. That's your, your mortgage payment. 
And then E is education, and it normally relates to education of your children or anyone else who you want to pay for their education. It does not have to be the full education. I have some parents who tell me, I went to school on scholarships, my parents helped, so I wanna pay 50% of my kids' education. And then I have others who say, no, I wanna pay 100%, I want them to be able to go to Harvard, I don't want money to be an issue, right? <laughs> so you have parents who have differences of opinions, so what I normally do is I calculate about 50000 a year for education if they want to pay the full amount. So you need about two hundred k for a four-year institution. But if someone says, oh, I only want to pay 50% and they need to get scholarships, then maybe you only calculate 100000 for your child's education. You add the dime figures up, and that's normally your minimum amount of insurance that you should apply for. Oh, that's great. That's actually the first time that I heard that, but that's super practical. And I think every any, anybody can understand that. And it customizes it specifically to what their needs and wants are. And it gives them kind of like a plan. So it incorporates all these planning things that they need to do in formulating their estate plan. So it makes that that much easier as well. So I really like that methodology. Yeah, that's so cool. Okay. Next. <laughs> so what's going on right now? Why it matters. COVID-19 is a pandemic nobody was prepared for. Let's be real. And people are dying. Uh, now, I will say more people are recovering and getting over the virus than are dying. But the reality is some people have health complications and the worst happens and they're just not prepared. So everyone should take advantage of this opportunity to think about your estate planning, to get your affairs in order and to get people covered. I have to be honest, I've been doing a lot of life insurance applications lately because my clients are thinking this through and they're like, look, I don't have enough. And I appreciate insurance policies that come with your employer, but I will say I'm a huge advocate of you getting insurance outside of your employer for several reasons. One being you may want to switch jobs and it's very expensive to take a life insurance policy with you. It's also not the best policies. The ones that your job gets, they're group term insurance policies, which means they get a cheaper rate because they have a large number of people they're insuring but they renew every year and they get more expensive the older you get. So rather than having to pay more and more each year, why not just invest in an affordable policy when you're young and healthy, you get to pay the same price the whole time, and you know that you can change your jobs for whatever reason, and it doesn't impact your life insurance. So think about all of those things and then think about what's going on now where insurance companies are actually having to reevaluate how they process applications because COVID-19 is impacting people in so many different ways and it is resulting in the death of individuals. So in some cases, it's taking longer to get insurance policies approved or if you've been diagnosed with COVID-19, they want to see how you respond and improve health-wise afterwards because they're taking on a risk of insuring you for a certain amount of money and their goal is not to pay, let's be honest. <laughs> they don't want to have to pay a huge sum, lump sum of money because you've passed away. And most good companies insure you the day after you're covered, um, give or take. Some have a two-year contestability period, which means the first two years, if you were to pass away, they may still pay, but they'll want to do an investigation to make sure you didn't uh, misguide them on your health or any other issues, right? So with COVID-19 and not knowing the long-term effects, you have a lot of insurance companies reevaluating how should they assess this and its impact to individuals' health. I've been pretty lucky in that my insurance companies that I work with, because I work with several, are processing claims the same way they were in the past, about two to three weeks to get covered once they look into your medical history. But there are still this factor of what are the long-term impacts, you know, how do we evaluate someone who may have taken much longer to recover from COVID-19 or maybe had a more severe impact from it, hospitalization, long-term respiratory or ventilator usage? You know, how does that play into their lifespan? And there's a lot of mathematicians doing the math behind the scenes to figure that out too. So yes, there is a health exam typically um, that you have when you apply for whole or per, um, permanent or 
um, term life insurance. Do you have you seen the way that they actually conduct those health exams change over the last uh, month or so? No changes yet, but they do have an individual who comes to your home typically and does um, a sa blood sample, urine sample, and ask you a couple of medical questions. And because of the scare around COVID-19, I've had some clients not want to take those exams, which delays your insurance coverage, right? If they can't determine you're healthy, they're not going to insure you sight unseen. So you have a delay in the processing. It is your choice to delay the exam. You don't have to invite this medical professional into your home to conduct it but you have to be able to live with the consequences that the longer you take to get insured, the longer it'll be before you have insurance. I was thinking about like for the examiners, I'm wondering if they were doing more televisits and then having the person just send labs like through the mail, through like a Quest yet. delivery system. Okay. I was just wondering, cause I, yeah, I can see. You do have some companies who will call you and they'll do the medical questions over the phone before they send a person, but they're still doing blood and urine for those that require those exams. Got you. Okay. Okay. Cool. So, um, yeah, like it is, all of this is scary. <laughs> all this is scary, but it's even more relevant right now because I know that each and every one of us has seen someone get sick or even pass away who we would never have expected. And what would that do to your family if that was you? Exactly. You have to think about that. So this is a time of real reflection on a lot of things, mm -hmm. but really the protection of your family should be paramount right now. And so I really feel like this conversation is super timely because I could talk about life insurance all the time, like seriously, because I really feel like it's um, something everybody knows that they need, but mm -hmm. always, always put it off. Just like put in their um, legacy plan and doing their estate planning, right. you know, like they always put it off. Like people don't know you're going to die. Yeah, you're going to die. Let's yeah. just have the conversation. Okay. <laughs> like you're going to die. Like, why are you so scared to talk about it? Why are you so scared to think about it? I mean, that avoidance could really make the hugest difference in your family's life. It affects your legacy. It's the reason why a lot of times, especially in the black community, we have to start over again. We, it's not that we didn't have the capacity or resources to get these things in place. We just didn't do it. Yeah. And the sad part is that sometimes they don't get to that level of self-insurance. People always think, oh, when I make more money, I'll be able to put more money aside and I'll do investing and then I'll have this money for my burial. But GoFundMe accounts for funerals is real. And that was actually one of the things that motivated me to get qualified to sell life insurance is because I saw what I wanted to be my last GoFundMe request for someone to pay for a funeral. And it happened to be for a family who was black, but then someone at my job passed away. Um, now, granted, it was a really, really tragic family accident where two of the adults in the family passed away at the same time and one of the children. So it wasn't expected to have that many people pass at the same time in a car accident. But the fact that they needed GoFundMe because the family didn't have insurance, that's when I was like, okay, this is crazy. Like these were middle income, so white American people who also had not thought of life insurance and now need the help of strangers to facilitate burial of their family members. And that's when I really had to sit back and say, okay, I need to do all that I can to educate people about today's life insurance, how affordable it can really be, and what you're getting. I mean, it's the best deal in town for some people. If you're paying $20 or $30 a month for two, three, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000 in coverage, you're never going to pay the insurance company the amount of money they're going to pay you. Never. Exactly. Exactly. Go for the investment that's small on a monthly basis, but can be such a huge reward for your family. Because like I said, it's more than just a burial. If you planned it right, if you follow the die method, you're going to spend maybe 20000 on a funeral, but then you have the rest to help your family live their lives after you. And who wants to be like tormented with 
worry of how am I going to make this bill? How am I going to cover your medical expenses? That those doctors, they don't say, oh, they died. We're not going to ask them to pay these bills. No, they, they come after you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, people don't realize just because you passed away doesn't mean you don't have to file taxes. Your estate still has to file taxes the final year you were alive. If there were any debt or loans forgiven, you may have to pay taxes on the forgiven debt. Where's this money going to come from? And not only that, but now you got to now, not only are you mourning the person that, that you lost, you trying to figure out where to come up with money. So that's just, it's unnecessary stress and unnecessary burden on your family and loved ones when they could be supported during this time of need. And the most important factor is life insurance benefits are not taxable. So you're leaving your family a tax-free gift that once they inherit it, they can take care of the ex final expenses, they can take care of your debt and bills, and they can have money left over to continue to live their life, sustain the lifestyle they had. So that's one less change they have to make. And Uncle Sam is not going to touch it. And in most cases, it's also not money that can be sued for or involved in any type of legal court juris, you know, cases. So if you happen to owe money for some reason to someone else, this is still protected income. So I, want, I, I can't emphasize that enough. People don't understand the value of tax-free income, but that's huge, okay? <laughs> Especially in a situation where you go from a two-income household to a one or a nun. This is, this is big. Yes. And this has just been such a timely, thorough, and just on point conversation. <laughs> you know, like I, yeah, I'm so glad that I brought you on to talk about this because like I said, I talk about insurance, pretty life insurance pretty often, but you know, I think that you bring such a fresh perspective and just all, all the, the good benefits that you're able to present uh, in the case around life insurance. It's like everybody who's listening to this, if you don't already have life insurance in place, you should have it in place. And, and if you do have life insurance in place, you should always be checking and making sure that you're paying the best price for your life insurance. So Aquania, if somebody wanted to work with you to get their life insurance in order, how do they reach out to you? Absolutely. Contact me via my website, thepurposeofmoney.com. I have a contact page. You can also reach me through Instagram at thepurposeofmoney. I have the ability to contact me via email through my Instagram page. I'm constantly here to help and support you with your financial plans, which will include life insurance if I have anything to do with it. And I'm here to answer questions as well. So feel free to reach out to me at thepurposeofmoney.com and I look forward to hearing from you. And Aquania is just a wealth of knowledge, all things financial from so many different levels. She has her own real estate investing, business, the insurance, the total whole personal finance picture. So she's just someone that you want to be in contact with in general. And again, if you want to learn about a little bit deeper about her background story, how she became a U.S. diplomat and how you can too listen to episode uh, 20 of the podcast. Thanks again, Aquania. This has been such a a timely and just awesome conversation. I really appreciate you being on. Thank you so much for having me. Take care. <laughs>